I still have my Christmas tree up because I haven't put it away yet. And also, that's not a window. That's a weird modern electronic fireplace thing. The place I live is not on fire. Hello and welcome to uh, Kyle Talks About writing. I've been experimenting with long form content. They tend to involve a lot of research, so I do write them all out ahead of time, and then I, you know, perform them very professionally. You kill <laughs> while his son is watching. Cut that part. But I have some topics I wanted to cover that I thought would actually work better in sort of a free form format. I've obviously covered superheroes already, exclusively. I do think about other things. I think my brain just gets clogged up, and I have not stopped thinking about superheroes for like 10 years. Who am I kidding? I've thought about superheroes my entire life. That's literally what I grew up on. I watched the Spider-Man 90s TV cartoon and I read my dad's old Marvel comic books and I played Spider-Man video games. It was mostly Spider-Man plus other people who tended to show up in Spider-Man. So I was really familiar with the Marvel heroes uh, as a little kid. And when they started being produced as films, that was just like a dream come true. I still can't believe the MCU happened honestly. Like, just the sheer scale of the cultural phenomenon that is the MCU, I don't think will ever happen again. And I never really agreed with people saying that the early superhero films weren't cinema or weren't as good as, I don't know, Tarantino movies. I like using food analogies to talk about films a lot. And my comparison for that has always been like, if you wanted ice cream and someone was like, oh, no, no, no. You should go have this steak at this restaurant in Paris. Great advice, but I don't want French steak. I want ice cream. That's why I'm going to Baskin Robbins. And I just think it's all equally valuable, you know? Like, it does. It just depends on what you're in the mood for. From my perspective, the MCU is effectively dead, despite whatever Disney keeps trying to sell us. It all culminated in Endgame, and they had those cool credits where all the actors signed their name, and then it was, and then it was done. That was all that needed to happen. I obviously care way too much about superheroes, but also, I think the MCU is kind of like looking at filmmaking under a microscope. A lot of issues I have with big movies and giant studio productions are specifically really apparent in the Marvel films. And like I said, it's been like 10 years. I've had a bunch of other nerdy friends who I talk to constantly about all of this stuff. Collectively, we've come up with all of these weird terms and rules and things that we've learned about writing by just observing what Disney has done with this one franchise. I figured I'd start today with something I learned during phase one of the MCU, uh, a rule that we developed and have referenced multiple times in our own writing that we call Asgard isn't interesting. <laughs> In the early days, they were much more dedicated to making each character's film feel more like its own genre. Iron Man felt like this, you know, modern story about a tech mogul coming to power. Captain America felt like a war film, at least the first one kind of seemed like it was supposed to. And then Thor was fantasy. They all ended up as kind of watered down versions of the genre they were going for and arguably would have been way cooler if they had kind of leaned into it more, but that's probably a whole other video. Thor is the Norse god Thor, like the literal actual god, and he's from the actual land of Asgard, which we see. And it's absolutely beautiful. It's this giant city of gold. They clearly put a lot of work into designing the visuals, and it's a steady location through several other films. Multiple characters come from there. Probably second only to New York City as, like, one of the Marvel central locations. And yet, every single time anybody goes there, I suddenly don't care about anything that's happening. It was hard to pin down exactly why for a while. This happens a few other times times too, as they kind of extend the MCU into space. I feel like Guardians of the Galaxy has this issue slightly, though not nearly as much. And then in Infinity War, half the film feels like it takes place on this barren planet where they're fighting Thanos. I just start tuning it all out. It's like there just isn't anything for my brain to grip onto. And this isn't just a problem in the MCU, which is kind of the whole point of these videos. And I'm kind of a writer, but mostly I just pay attention to things that don't matter. I think the next most obvious example of this problem is occasionally there's like a big blockbuster original sci-fi film, or at least one you haven't heard of before. It's probably still an existing thing. The recent ones that come to mind were like that one with Eddie Redmayne as the villain, Jupiter Ascending. And then there's another one that isn't that one that stars the kid that plays the Green Goblin in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Dane DeHaan. That's his name? Why is- how is that his name? And that girl that looks just like him, but they aren't related in the movie. Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. Came out in 2017. I thought that was way more recent than it was. <laughs> and the other person is Cara Delevingne, and they do look very similar 
in that movie for some reason. I feel like I made my point though, which is that I don't remember either of those movies. And I watched one of them all the way through, and I'm not even sure which one it was. It had to have been Jupiter Ascending. And it feels like there's one of these like every couple of years. I know I've seen trailers for similar sci-fi films more recently than 2017. And if it's not sci-fi, it's some high fantasy thing where a chosen one kid has to go fight an evil king. And the problem is not they're repeating the same idea over and over again. But whenever I actually watch the movies and don't just ignore the trailers, the problem seems to be yet again that Asgard isn't interesting. If you create this whole big fantasy world that is nothing like Earth, filled with characters that don't talk like us, don't really look like us, don't dress like us, don't follow our customs, space land, and the war of the seven Dr. Seuss monsters. It doesn't stick in your brain because you've never heard any of those things before in your entire life. There is nothing in these movies to ground us. When everything is unfamiliar, it becomes really hard to stay invested in the story. Stories work best when we can immediately project ourselves onto someone or something happening in the scene. And it doesn't take much, and it can happen in worlds that we aren't familiar with. That's why Lord of the Rings and Star Wars are all popular. They may take place in different worlds, they may have absurdist elements and use crazy, wacky names, and we don't forget those details. Their made-up names become part of our regular vocabularies. We may even name our kids after them. The worlds become places we want to visit. We can actually remember remember details about it and could probably navigate it if we suddenly showed up there. But Asgard never became one of those places for some reason. And again, it's not just that those films did it first and now anything else feels like it's copying those originals. Most of the time, they're actually not successfully doing the same thing at all. I'll use Star Wars as an example since every writing class in the world loves to use Star Wars as an example. Star Wars could be textbook Asgard. Nothing there is familiar. It doesn't take place on Earth. None of their names are anything real. There's aliens walking around, people with funny heads and robots. Except that that's actually not quite true. We start out on a kid on a farm named Luke. Lord of the Rings is the original dense fantasy. But in the movie, a lot of the hobbits' lives feel very relatable. They're just little guys enjoying food, having a holiday. They're just like British people. The familiarity just being present, though, is not quite enough when you're being introduced for the first time to a massive world that you don't recognize. There is one extra step that tends to be forgotten, and it is that the audience needs to learn things. I just praised Star Wars for actually not explaining everything that was going on in the world. They walk into this cantina full of aliens, and they're all just kind of there. They have nothing to do with the scene, they don't really interact with the main characters in any way, and it just kind of shows us that this is what goes on here. But there's a difference between adding flavor to your world and expecting your audience to just kind of be on the same page from the get-go. Like I said earlier, the audience needs someone to latch on to. That's sort of how stories work. In fact, if you're ever stuck starting a story, the easiest, cheapest way to grab your audience's attention is open on a scene with a person struggling. And that guy that we see could be billionaire Tony Stark, but if the first thing we see happen to him is that his car gets blown up and he's scrambling around for his life, we are now that snarky billionaire, even though we're not anything like that guy. Breaking Bad does this all the time, including the lack of context. In the first episode, the dude has crashed his RV and he scrambles out of it in his underwear, completely terrified, holding a gun. And you don't know what's happening, but he's certainly having a bad day. It's important that we are on the same page as some of the characters experiencing that world. If everybody in the world is familiar with where they are except you, then it feels like it's not for you. You feel disconnected and like you don't belong, you weren't invited. You just become more of an observer and you're trying to pick up the details of what you're looking at. And without that baseline, it becomes much harder to tell like, is this normal? Are these people reacting to this thing in a way that somebody else would in the same world? Luke doesn't react to the aliens in the bar. And we know that means those are normal because he does react like a normal teenager when he's told he can't go fly jets for a living. He's disappointed that he doesn't get to go do the thing that he wanted to do. He's tired of being on this planet. His life is similar to ours in all these core ways, so when he acts differently to something than we would, uh, we know that that's normal for him too. And then when he acts surprised by a hologram popping out of the robot he just bought, 
we know that's unusual. My favorite recent example of this in media is actually the anime Attack on Titan. You have no idea what's going on in that show. I wasn't supposed to. None of the characters in the show knew what was going on either. They were all trying to figure it out. And when they got new information, they would put it together with what they already knew. And they would learn something new about their world that then I also learned at the same time because I was watching them figure it out. Anime actually does a pretty good job most of the time of using normalcy to established context and boundaries around the ridiculous fantasy situations that they introduce. One popular example of this I've heard is the Persona series. I've not actually played them myself, but they did ask me to promote their new game. For, for, it's an actual ad. This is real. It's an ad. It's 60 seconds. I need the money. Hi, Ad Kyle here, wearing a sweater because I got cold and I still didn't take down the tree. Persona 3 Reload is the captivating reimagining of the pivotal game of the Persona series. Faithfully rebuilt with cutting edge graphics, modernized quality of life features, and signature stylish UI. Basically a ground up remake of Persona 3, which I'm actually pretty excited about because I've been wanting to get into the Persona series for a while. The story is self-contained and you don't have to have played any other Persona game to get started on this one. It's like an alternate universe modern day role-playing game with fantasy elements. Half of it is like this social focused role-playing story and the other half is this strategic fantasy combat system where you battle people with your persona, sort of your character's avatar in this other world. Both sides affect each other, you develop relationships with all the other characters in the game, it's all about the meaning of existence and your own mortality, all that fun stuff. And now you can play the game without having to go back to the old graphics from forever ago. It's available on Xbox Series XS, Xbox One, Windows, Steam, PlayStation 5, and PlayStation 4. It's good, because it means I can play it. It's available for pre-order today, and it launches tomorrow, February 2nd. Be sure to check out our link in the description to get yourself a copy, and also to support this channel. A counterexample to that would be Lost, which frustrated many people by being too mysterious. And I think part of that is that there were a bunch of characters who would show up clearly knowing what was happening and just not telling you. And that created that disconnect where you were like, okay, well I, now I'm just kind of watching something that I'm not a part of and don't understand. When we're first introduced to Thor, he's fighting a bunch of big monsters we don't know on an ice world. We can kind of piece it together. He can laser from one planet to another. He's a prince. His dad is a king. He's a spoiled rich brat who needs to be taught a lesson. And I think it never really gets fixed because while Thor talks about Asgard to his Earth friends, there's really no interaction all the way up until Thor Ragnarok. Even when he brings Natalie Portman back to Asgard in the second movie, they don't really use that opportunity to give more context through, I don't know, her reacting like a normal human being. We have to do that again. Hi. Like, I'm pretty sure she kind of looks around in awe and makes some observation that one of their devices is like some science that she heard of once. But imagine if he had brought Tony Stark back. He would have had some things to say, some like normal human interactions like, you guys have a lot of gold, or why is everybody wearing such ridiculous hats? Is there a ceremony going on or is this just the style these days? I don't know, questions that like you probably would have if you visited a foreign country even? But because no one in the movie asks them, we don't ever get any context, we don't know the answers, and so it just stays uninteresting. I know I'm not the first one to figure this out, but I don't know, it's just stuff that I think about a lot, and it also always feels obvious, like once I learn something I think, well surely everybody else knows this and I'm just behind. But maybe I'm not, and this was interesting, and maybe even helpful if you're a writer and you get stuck on things like this. If you liked it or hated it, I'd love to know. I have plenty more topics to bring up if uh, you did enjoy it. You might be able to tell by my general demeanor and face that I still haven't slept, but you can help make that happen. After the last video that I posted up, uh, our Patreon actually went up by like $700. We have two or 300 new people. Uh, and I just want to say thank you so, so very much. I said that if we hit $4,000 by the end of this month, I would take better care of myself. And that motivated a bunch of you to go donate money. And I, that's incredible. You're amazing. Thank you. I'm still aiming for that. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing more of these videos and in supporting me making them, head on over to patreon.com slash doormonster. You can get more content. I do streams and podcasts and you can get bonus rewards for higher tiers, but you only have to give a dollar. Every little bit helps and uh, the more it goes up, the less stressed out I get about finances. So everybody who has donated already, you've genuinely made a huge difference. And if we can raise about another thousand by the end of the month, I will do the Kyle Sleeps stream. And I will live stream myself sleeping an entire night so you can all know for sure that it happened. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a great weekend and I will see you soon.